Thank you, Annie. And thank you for joining us for the session this morning. Um, out of curiosity, can I see a show of hands? Who of you founded a startup already? OK. And who of you is thinking about founding a startup? Excellent. So we got the right crowd here. <laughs> Good. Before we speak about becoming the diamond in that rough, I'd like to take a step back, because I think that's also important to answer that question. And it is about the what and the who. So what do you want to found a startup for? And who is the team that you need most? Um, Marissa, do you want to take that question and answer how important it is to have a market fit in the people team? Oh, well. I think you don't really, it's very rare that you have product market fit before you have a product. So I think the first, the first step is getting something in people's hands as quickly as possible. And that can be anything from, I think people are always surprised when we work with first time founders about how little it takes to test an idea in some way. Uh, literally a paper, a piece of paper with a description of what you want to do and some like illustrative images and sort of sliding that across the table to someone that's like your potential customer and being like, what do you think about this? Like, are you interested in this? Would you want to buy this? That seems so sort of hacked together to some people, especially first time founders. But that's really all it takes to start testing and iterating your idea. So my first advice to anyone who's thinking about starting a company, it's like, talk to your customer as soon as possible before you quit your day job, before you do anything else, just start talking to the person who, uh, or the businesses that are your customer, um, and just start to get you know, low stakes feedback on what you're thinking. Um, and in terms of the second part of the question, who? Uh, you know, certainly if you're building something technically oriented and you're not technical, you need a co-founder as soon as possible that is, that is technical. You want the person building the product with you to be as invested as you are. Um, but other than that, I would say it's more psychographic stuff than skill stuff. Like This is a, a slog of optimism, and you really need other people that have Optimism, like optimism, is like a, it's like a burden <laughs> in entrepreneurship. And you, I always say to our team, like no one person can carry the optimism burden by themselves. And so you need other people that, you know, when you're feeling discouraged, are gonna sort of pick that up, uh, and vice versa. And you want people that are intellectually honest and not delusional. But generally, optimism is like such a I can't I can't stress that enough. <laughs> if you're gonna get into this game, you need a lot of it. And if it doesn't come naturally to you, you need to surround yourself with people that it does come naturally to. Like, I'm someone that is very pragmatic, so it doesn't always come naturally to me. And so I have, luckily, have people around me that fill that gap when I need it. Yeah, I appreciate that with the optimism. That's certainly very helpful to have, have team members. Um, catching back on, on the, the testing and speaking with potential clients, Charlie, you're looking at a startup scene from a legal point of view. So what would you say, when do you recommend the team to get legal advice? At which point in the journey they're taken? Yeah, um, thanks. So I, I guess I'd, I'd just back up a second. Um, we start with why. So uh, why at Sinac, if you're familiar with them, um, we're a mission-driven company. So we start with, with why. And for us, it's the legal system's broken. Uh, everywhere around the world, uh, it just costs too much. Um, the elephant in a room is cost, and um, our mission is to make law affordable enough for everybody. And so uh, as far as the who, uh, when we survey our employees and our team now, it's finding people for whom uh, solving that problem, fulfilling that mission is going to be really fulfilling for them, rewarding for them whether we make a dime at it or not. And so the who are people who are really, and the happiest people that work in our business are the people that connect with that purpose. Uh, and I'm really proud uh, that we've had people that have been with us for a decade. The first person I hired back to was a technical person. Uh, we still work together. And uh, that was uh, 14 years ago when we started. So um, I think if you start with why and then connect with people who share that, who want to be on that journey to solve that problem, uh, you're, you're going to have a, a wonderful time, whether it works or not, and a lot of startups don't work. As far as legal, uh, 
at the very beginning. And so um, one of the reasons that I started the company is I got to see the difference between my dad's chain of gas stations where I grew up working, uh, and then I represented Yahoo from two employees up through their IPO. And I got to see the difference in access to legal services and, quite frankly, access to the tools of justice that my dad had with his gas stations and that the clients I had, you know, when I became a lawyer, Goldman Sachs, banks, and v VCs, you know, and well-funded tech companies. And I wanted Rocket Lawyer to be able to provide that superpower. So you start at the very beginning, you set your business up correctly. I've seen the difference, lastly, uh, with great legal advice between founders who can actually get uh, uh, liquidity, who can actually control their destiny better, uh, and, and ultimately get a reward for many, many years of hard work is the difference between the legal advice that they got at the very beginning. So what you're basically saying is that almost as early as when they have the idea that is validated in some sense, not maybe even with a product um, testing, they should start to get legal advice, the founders? Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm saying exactly that. Okay. And I can say a lot more Good. about it, but I'll stop now. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Let's assume we have um, a wonderful team, great founders. We have a product fit. We have a market fit. We have legal advice. Um, we get investors. So a lot, of, a lot of startups are enticed to become a unicorn, especially if they're using technology that is fast scalable, because then it makes sense to scale fast, and you need a lot of investment money for that. But Rupa, I mean, you're from uh, Techstars, and you're the chief acceleration investment officer. Do we honestly always have to aim to become a unicorn? Yeah, that is a great question, Britta. So we see a lot of companies every year. We made 450 investments last year. We'll make north of 600 this year. We're looking to scale to thousands in a few years' time. And I think it is fascinating to see the spread of um, startup founders who come to us. Some have set their sights on being a unicorn, and that's what they're focused on. And there are others that say, I want to grow this to a sustainable business somewhere between you know, a 200 and a $500 million valuation. It doesn't have to be a unicorn. And that's absolutely fine as well. The, the goal is to build a sustainable business that can actually add value and solve a problem for customers over time. The goal shouldn't be to get to a magic number, si simply because that is a number. Right. I mean, how, how do you go about it? You have uh, funded numerous startups, and you're um, yeah. supporting them. What, how, do you, how do you advise them to pursue either the route of, like, let's say, a unicorn or what I call a small giant, a, a startup that's growing profitably, but yeah. slowly? I mean, I'd also say there's a lot of numbers under a couple hundred million that are pretty interesting <laughs> in terms of life-changing numbers for people. I think, uh, you know, Self-awareness is really important in this line of work as well. And I think doing the work to really understand what you want personally versus what the sort of startup mythology and ecosystem is telling you should, you should want, um, figuring that out as soon as possible. Because if what you want is a $10 million business with 50% margins and like a great lifestyle and you know ownership of your own destiny because you don't have investors on your cap table then like that's like a great life build that business don't go try to raise money from people that are going to try to make you into a unicorn and do that and and don't sort of buy into and if you if what you want is somewhere between the thing i always say is there's so many numbers between 0 and a billion figure out which one is going to change your life in the ways you want it to change um, and then just go build that. And there is, you know, 99.9% .9 of the businesses in the world are not venture-backed tech startups. Right. <laughs> and so there's lots of opportunity to build lots of great things, lots of impactful things that don't fit into that sort of archetype. Um, and there's an ecosystem of resources for people that want to build those things. Unfortunately, those, those sort of types of investors don't have as much of a media presence, so people don't know about them. But you know, there are all sorts of ways to get smaller businesses off the ground. Not enough, um, but there are. Yeah. Uh, and so I think just turning inward and thinking about what's really going to be meaningful to you is sort of the first step. 
Right. And Charlie, your legal expertise, how does it tie into the decision of, you know, aiming to become that unicorn or pursuing a more sustainable growth path? Um, would, you, would you agree that um, if a company decides to become a unicorn that you have more work, so for, it's, for you it's more profitable versus a startup that decides to grow more sustainable because then you would have less work with them? Yeah. Um, I, I would just say you do you, right? And you, you've got to be authentic. You've got to, um, back to having a sense of purpose, you know, why are, why are you doing it? Um, and to be uh, uh, frank and authentic myself, I've seen uh, startups succeed or fail uh, regardless of pretty much every factor that I could sit here and say, do this or do that, where I've seen the people involved be fulfilled and rewarded the most is when they are their authentic selves. And so I started Rocket Lawyer um, uh, as my second startup. Uh, I bootstrapped Rocket Lawyer uh, at the beginning, uh, and we fundraised for the first time uh, in the fourth quarter of 2008, which was a time very similar to right now. Um, that was the first time we took outside investment at sort of the, the depths of the Great Recession. Uh, and, and, then, and then we grew. Um, and, and, and so there's no one size fits all, uh, but I, I will just sort of ra say again, be authentic. If you're, if you're in it to flip it, uh, there's a process for that and be authentic to it. That's absolutely not, uh, that didn't work for me or doesn't work for my team. Uh, we decided to build a business that was cash flow positive, uh, profitable uh, business that, we're, that was going to be durable because the problem, lastly back to where I started, the problem, this intractable problem of justice being unaffordable for people around the world is not gonna be solved in my career. It's not going to be solved uh, before I retire. So uh, what, what, what we're really focused on is building a durable platform that will endure beyond us, and there's a process for making that happen. That uh, isn't necessary for every startup. Every startup, the why isn't, uh, isn't sort of a multi-generational ambition like the one that we're chasing after. So I just be authentic with what what works for you, and then uh, pursue it to the best of your ability. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good um, point that you mentioned, but because that leads me to the second question. I mean, we are in a, in a time where we're facing several challenges. I mean, there's climate challenge, um, climate change, then we have the looming recession coming up. We just kind of got out of the pandemic. What do you see the things that are most necessary to be founded on? So ideas that founders should start and take and build a business out of the, um, for the future. What new businesses need to be founded from your point of view? Rupa, do you want to start? Well, the interesting thing here is that every business is very personal to the founder that founds it. So in a sense, every single founder that's out there, if you go look in the halls here, saw a problem and instead of sitting on the sidelines, decided to jump in and solve it. So, it almost doesn't matter to some extent. I think there are definitely problems in the world that need to be solved. Among the startups that we saw in yesterday's pitch semifinal, there was one that was developing a solution to help detect mental disorder in young kids, make it cheap and affordable. There was one that was helping small and medium-sized businesses with cybersecurity issues. There was one that was actually had an interesting you know, little solution for women who want to paint their nails a different color. Right? So everything is sort of personal to the founder who founds it. The fact of the matter is, the problems are not going to be solved just by startup founders. I actually do think large problems like climate change are going to require collective action on the part of governments and radical change in lifestyle and societies, right? So just to be clear, however, there are a lot of ways in which founders can contribute. And I think it's really up to them to follow their hearts, see a problem. Just because you see a problem doesn't mean that you're the person to solve it. If you care deeply about something, that's what you should be. As Charlie said, it's got to be authentic. It's got to come from your heart. Yeah, I know, but um, should, shouldn't we as influencers, advisors to founders, potential founders, try to 
entice them to found more businesses that help climate change, that help find um, humanity, that help increase diversity, all these important topics that are necessary for us as humanity to continue to stay on. I mean, if I, don't take me the wrong way, but if I combine or, or com um, um, okay, geez, here's my German going. <laughs> if I compare a startup that does something for painting nails, I do that sometimes too, and I see a startup that is helping to feed the world in the next 10 years, I mean, my choice is clear. Yeah. So shouldn't, shouldn't we really um, inspire the tech community to pursue paths more towards fulfilling goals that yeah. help us in the future? Marissa? Uh, I mean, I, I think one example is in, you know, Web3 is sort of a dirty word at this point, but in Web3, the promise of blockchain, the promise of a DAO, the promise of sort of the, the philosophy of that whole space talks a lot about redistribution of wealth and control and ownership. And I think that is absolutely a possibility, but it has to be done very consciously. Any illusion that a bunch of the same demographics of engineer, like the, the engineering community, the investment community, the tech community is still very homogeneous for the most part. The idea that that redistribution is just going to happen naturally within that community is a little bit ridiculous, I think. But I'm personally very interested, you know, as I look at Web3 as an investment space, where, you know, where are areas where that redistribution of wealth is real, right? Like, where are there models, marketplace models, for example, where, uh, traditionally underserved customer who makes up a disproportionate amount of that industry now has opportunity to own or participate in the upside of, of an economy or ecosystem that they have historically sort of been exploited in. Right. Um, I think that's really interesting. I mean, you look at, you know, uh, all the things we talk about with models like Uber or uh, Instacart or some of these, these marketplace models where, let's be real, half of the marketplace is sort of being exploited. Um, those, are bis those are areas where I think Web3 in particular, if we can figure out, there's a lot to figure out still, but I, I hope that there are entrepreneurs looking at those spaces and being like, where can I actually redistribute wealth? Uh, okay, we're in the last, we're yeah, in the we're, last we're minute, run, Charlie. Yeah, we're <laughs> running out of time. I, I do want to try to give you the best of my ability. We're, we're, we're moving into a time of, um, of, of struggle a bit. It's not an abundant time. It's more of a scarce time. So uh, having started a, having done a startup at that time and then watched it grow for the decade after the recession, I would really encourage you, number one, do something that, again, even if you don't make money at it, you're going to be glad that you did it. And number two, pick something that, where there's some tools that are already out there. So we're trying to give the next generation of legal tech entrepreneurs APIs and a platform so that the barriers to entry are lower than when uh, the first generation started. There are multiple industries like that where there's tooling out there in your startup that you can, um, that it can actually cut your cost to get going, and um, we took advantage of that when I started Rocket Lawyer. I hope that you find something you're really passionate about, but in, in a time of scarcity, as we're in now, um, it's important that you can uh, pick something that you can build uh, uh, efficiently and cost-effectively as well. So. Okay, Best of luck, and I hope that's we're helpful. Coming, we're coming back to the passion, the optimism. Find, find the right topic that is not only helpful for you, but it's for, helpful for all of us. And uh, yeah, find the right team. Thank you so much. It was thank a pleasure you. having you on stage, thank and thank you for joining us.